Hello and welcome. Can you hear me? Dzień dobry. Czy mnie słychać? Hi, we hear you. I am a host of this session for IGF. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. Słychać mnie? Ja bo nie, mam, nie mam głosu, wiecie co chodzi, nie mam głosu. Halo? Ah, yes, we hear you. Please uh, contact yourself with English, please. Okay, of course. Um, can you hear me? No? Yes, we hear you. Wonderful. Okay, as I see, Przemysław don't have uh, his speakers on. Actually, we, we, actually, I'm uh, actually, actually I can hear you now. So the oh, question great. is, we hear uh, you. We hear you, Przemysław. Yes, Slav. everything is okay. Okay. Yeah. Small thing. We wait just a moment for another panelist. Yes. Okay. Czyli się sypią, nie mogę się za blisko.
Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see your presentation. Everything yes. is okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Do you, do, you, do you hear me well? Yes, everything is okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Hello, and how about me? Am I heard? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. I presume I can be heard. Shama? Hi everyone, this is Host speaking. Please be informed that the session is recorded and hosted under the IGF Code of Conduct and UN Rules and Regulation. The chat feature is for social chat only and only the Q&A feature is used to ask questions. Thank you.
Hello and welcome. Um, I believe we can start our panel. I'm honored to uh, host, to moderate uh, today's panel. And we will be discussing the newest report uh, from Politica Insight Analytical Center, Skills for Tomorrow, How to Build Future Skills in Post-Pandemic World. Uh, my name is Monika Helak, and I'm uh, the researcher uh, in Politica Insight. Uh, but before uh, we begin our discussion panel, I will shortly introduce uh, our guests. Uh, and later I will um, give, uh, give the floor to Adam Czerniak to present uh, the base, basic recommendations of our report. Uh, later we will discuss. Uh, and after that, uh, I remind that uh, we have planned a Q&A session. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, bear in mind that it will be possible to discuss it with our guests. Uh, so in alphabetical order, uh, I introduce uh, Alexander Arabacic, uh, which is president uh, of Academy of European Careers Foundation. Uh, which is a project initi initiated in the Warsaw School of Economics, uh, aimed to uh, enable contacts between uh, academic experts and uh, professionals working for uh, Polish uh, um, administ uh, public administration and business. Uh, second, uh, Adam Czerniak, PhD Chief Economist and direct Director for Research at Politica Insight. Uh, and also uh, co-author of uh, this report uh, we, were, we will be discussing today. Uh, next is the Przemysław Kurczewski, which is Deputy Director for in National Center for Research and uh, Development. And he oversees um, uh, some innovative instruments, uh, financing, uh, sorry, um, research and development. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, Antoni Rytel, uh, which is Deputy Director in uh, GovTech Poland uh, and also Specialist in uh, Economics uh, and uh, Cybersecurity. Uh, and now I will pass voice to Adam uh, and uh, yes, sorry. Hello, thank you, Monica. Hello, everyone. Uh, great to see you. Um, on this international conference as we are in times of pandemia. So every chance and opportunity to meet is uh, wonderful. Um, as Monica said, I'm the author of the report and I would like to present you um, with the main findings of the report. Uh, but before I start, I would like to tell you the background, how the report was prepared. Um, because we started to prepare this report um, in early spring this year. So before uh, the pandemics really, um, and, you know, um, increased in dynamics. We knew it was there, it was in China, it was in Italy. But first, when we designed the product, it was just meant uh, to analyze the competence and skills of the future um, without a pandemic. And now we have, and we had throughout uh, the time period of uh, preparing the report, we had the opportunity to see in action how uh, a digital world is created and what are the pitfalls of this world and uh, how this tells us about the state uh, of our skills for the future. So um, please be prepared to um, go with me throughout the beginning of the pandemics, the pandemics and what we know about it for the future. I will start with sharing my screen. Give me a second. I hope everyone sees uh, the presentation right now. Yeah, Monica is nodding her head, great. Um, so, um, let me start with explaining what are the components of the future or future skills. Um, we can divide future skills into three subgroups, social, technical, and cognitive 
uh, future skills. Of course, the technical are those that are most easily associated with future skills. So do you know how to use a computer program, how uh, to um, write down an algorithm that computes something uh, in a more advanced setting. You know what is machine learning and how to program machines. Uh, so how to use them and how to program machines, these are technical skills. Then you also think about cognitive skills, which are quite important future skills. So how to analyze data in a world that's overflown with data. You have plenty of information um, coming from different um, sources and you need to analyze them. You need to think critically uh, and uh, you need to be very flexible because the world is constantly changing and you need to acquire new ideas uh, to think them over and to make up your own opinion about them. And these are the cognitive skills that you need in a world uh, that's suffocating from information. But please not forget the last one. And for me, the most important skills, which are social skills, because in a world like this, like today, it's very important to work in teams, uh, even though you are hundreds or even thousands of kilometers far away from each other, just to work in teams uh, to keep mental health during uh, the times of isolation, uh, to encourage people to join your team, to understand various kinds of people, because sometimes you're uh, overthrown with information and you need to you know, be open to people that think differently than you, uh, to include them in your team, and to have the ethics that are also um, including them, not excluding, but including, including everyone, because otherwise you will be building a world of the future that's really to several aspects damaged. Um, if you look at the top 10 skills of 2025, which is prepared by the World Economic Forum, uh, that's this year's edition. Mm, they prepare the 10 top skills of the, uh, uh, each uh, uh, World Economic Forum edition. So you see here that the most important ones are those connected to problem solving, so analytical thinking, the cognitive skills I was talking about in, mm, a minute ago. Uh, to complex uh, critical thinking and analysis, and also just working with people, which is very important um, skill, so leadership, social influence, and uh, connection with data. These are the future skills, and they are very important. And we know that already for a couple of years, because the World Economic Forum presented a very similar um, list of skills for already over a decade, uh, but the pandemics, revealed uh, how important these skills are. However, before the pandemic started, before we got the first infections here in Europe, um, state of the future competences was not uh, that good, especially in Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, here on the slide you have on a map Europe digital skills, that's an index prepared by uh, Eurostat, which analyzes um, how high are skills of uh, European citizens. Um, here you have a uh, percentage of people with basic or higher digital skills and so know how to use applications, how to send information over the internet, how to obtain information, how to handle, for example, a hard drive or a smartphone. Uh, it, uh, you add all those things together, then you get uh, the digital skill index. And you see that, for example, in Nordic countries, a uh, vast majority of people have a basic or high digital skills, but it's not the same in Central and Eastern European countries where uh, below 50% of people that have at least basic skills uh, in the digital sector. Germany is standing out as well. Uh, United Kingdom is uh, at uh, also a high uh, rate, but then you have Mediterranean countries which are also quite weakly performing. And that's 
the picture of Europe that entered uh, the pandemic and entered the lockdown. And the moment at which we started uh, to work remotely from home and uh, learn from home and communicate from home, have weddings over the internet, bachelor's parties via Zoom, that's the place we started. And what the pandemic revealed, what has happened in between, um, and what kind of digital skills are there um, already, and we did not know them, um, but what we need to learn more. Um, in our report, we presented five main findings, but of course there were several minor findings as well, so please uh, read the report. You will have a QR code at the end of my presentation so to download it. Um, but let's start with the first, uh, I think, most vivid finding uh, of the pandemic, that remote work is efficient. What we do here say having a conference over the internet or deliver a lecture over the internet or just work on a daily basis uh, in an um, um, office somewhere um, out of your regular office, it is efficient. For example, I'm right now in the southern part of Poland in the mountains as, and I can deliver um, a short presentation to you and it works and it's efficient and it's almost the same kind of presentation I would deliver to you when uh, I would be based in my Warsaw office. And this is not only the BPO sector of the economy, uh, so these people that work in offices usually work 8, 10, 12 hours sitting in front of their uh, computer desk, but also in other branches um, of the economy it happened that remote work has revealed to be efficient. And that's something beyond imagination of many managers and of many people that were walking um, uh, before saying, no, no remote work, we need to meet that's uh, the essence of capitalism. We need to meet each other, discuss ideas in person, meet over a coffee, uh, no remote work. Um, for example, on the left-hand side of your slide, you have the data on remote work during the pandemic uh, in comparison to what was before in Poland. So in 2019, only 4.6% of jobs were remote jobs. Throughout the pandemic, um, in March and April, in some sectors, this share this spiked over 40%. And as you see on the right hand side of your slide, Poland was not the leader. Uh, the digital skills in Poland are not as good as you know. And uh, despite the fact that uh, almost 100% of companies have a broadband internet connection, um, and the knowledge of how to use remote work um, was not that spread out. In many countries of Europe, uh, especially in Nordic countries, we have seen an uh, increase up to 60% on average um, with remote uh, jobs. Mm, that's really marvelous that almost two thirds of the economy can be transferred to the internet. So everyone who was able to work remotely just did that. Because please remember that we have agriculture, have manufacturing, so these are jobs you until now at least you cannot perform remotely so all the other jobs were just transferred to the internet and became remote that's really uh, a marvelous result what's more according to uh, international monetary fund estimates uh, around 15 to 30 percent of the jobs will remain remote even after the pandemic and that's in line with what people want uh, managers are happy with the fact that we work remotely because we are efficient. People are happy because they can care more about their family. They do not have uh, commuting costs going from home to work and back. Um, so majority of your population would like to remain working remotely at least once or twice a week. Here on the left hand side, we have this big circle uh, with data from Poland, but that's what we have observed throughout the pandemic in almost every country in the European Union. The people 
are really liking to work remote? Of course, not throughout the whole week, not all day long, but for some days, it's really efficient. But of course, we need soft skills because there are pitfalls of the digital age. And that's uh, the backside of the coin that the pandemic revealed. Of course, the remote work is efficient. But if you stay at home for one week, two weeks, okay, that may be okay. But if you stay at home and work for one month or even a couple of months, then you seriously may have some problems. Um, as research revealed, an hour of telework is more mentally exhausting than three hours meeting in a conference room. And you know how hard it is to sit for three hours in a conference meeting in person. So please imagine how hard it is to have a one hour meeting uh, over the internet. 22% um, of respondents said they, they encountered enormous difficulties while focusing at work and managing free time. There is no work-life balance. It's very hard because you do not leave your office. You have the whole day at your office. I myself sometimes uh, realize it's 10 p.m. and I need to finish my job at this moment and need to care about my family, uh, about my cat, to, to feed her. And that's very, very tough because you do not have the proper skills to manage work-life balance. Then, of course, remote education. That's a huge problem, especially in Central and Eastern Europe countries where teachers fell affected by the COVID-19. Uh, there are decrease in mental health and physical health um, re response. It said that two-thirds of teachers are really feeling mentally uh, and physically worse than they were during having their class in a normal analog way. And of course, there's the thing of loneliness the kind of anxiety that you feel while working remotely. These are very, very important pitfalls of the digital age, and you need soft skills. You need to know how to manage your physical, um, your psychological emotions, and how to cope with the feeling of loneliness, how to engage in online meetings uh, so that you are not that tired while doing them, these are very important soft skills. Without them, uh, it will be very hard to move our economy into digital age uh, without having major social problems. But of course, that's not the only thing that the pandemic reveals. The next thing is, and that's also very important, closely connected to, to the last one, that we have economic inequalities and they are amplified in a digital environment. As you see here, that's the digital skills in Poland's job market. We divided them uh, for uh, unemployed, self-employed, uh, or persons of permanent employment uh, in comparison to the total value of digital skills. And you see that unemployed people are doing worse uh, in every way um, when it comes down to digital skills than persons that have permanent employment. Okay, you might ask, what do you see a correlation, but what's the relationship? What's uh, causing what? Uh, are people mm, being unemployed because they do not have digital skills? Or while being unemployed, they did not have the possibility to build their digital skills? The answer is not simple. That's a recursive relationship. So uh, people that are hiring um, so in her uh, department do not put so much stress on uh, checking whether a person has digital skills or not. It's not on their priority list. But there is a mechanism that drives this relationship that people that are unemployed from low income households do have low digital skills. And what's more, their children most likely will have low digital skills and will be subject to digital exclusion. How does it work? So if you are from a poor household, usually you are located in a rural area and you do not have right a computer, a camera, you even do not have access to broadband internet. 
okay? Um, over 30% of households in poor and rural areas do not have access to broadband internet. So that's a severe problem when the pandemic struck and kids that need to go to school via the internet could not do that. Why? Simply because they do not have the computer, they could not connect to their teachers, so they vanished from the education system. That was a huge problem in Martin April in Poland, where kids just vanished from the education system. Then you have women, um, okay? Uh, usually in a traditional uh, type of family, the man is earning, brings his earnings home. Women are treated as secondary earners at home. So if it comes to the pandemic and you just have one laptop, hmm, who do not get access to the laptop? Men? or the women. Of course, uh, the pandemic revealed the women did not. So they remain at home, they need to care for the children which stay at home, and uh, this also restrains them as a wall from accessing uh, their jobs. And they just need to quit or go on a uh, leave, a sick leave or a uh, leave to care for their children. And of course, um, then you have to care about the children, which also uh, prevents you from uh, doing your job and keeping your work-life balance intact. And of course, if you do not have digital skills, if you do not have contacts to online administration resources, you are excluded from school. Simple as that, you won't have a well-paid job. You're very, very um, uh, mm, hold back from accessing uh, the ladder of um, jobs. So it's hard to acquire a better job, to get out of a poor household. So this will be amplified in a digital world where access to resources will be the key to be part of a digital economy. Then of course, um, um, also very important factor I want um, focus for long is that legislation became obsolete um, during the pandemic. There are plenty of documents that you need to fill in and bring in person, in paper, this red tape to an office, uh, to my university um, where I teach. That's really obsolete that we need to have a printer and we have a need to a scanner right now and just send scans of your signature. It's absurd and that um, such kind of legislation is there in many, many parts of the economy which hampers the introduction of digital solutions. But the most important thing is not that there is legislation that hampers good digital solutions. The main problem is that the digital solutions themselves are ill-conceived. That the way in which uh, we designed uh, applications for smartphones, for example, applications to get to your um, uh, administration, to contact your administration, your tax collector. They were ill designed. Also applications uh, to use your banking account, they were quite good in Poland, uh, or to use remotely any kind of service that were using uh, analog before. Why so? First of all, a business process in many, many companies is not uh, properly defined, it's Latin. And we do not know how it goes. It's not written down anywhere. You do not have a strategy, a standard um, of how to deal with documents, with clients. It's just, you know, if you have a micro company of out of five people, uh, then uh, you sometimes just go by uh, learning by doing. So you learn how to operate a company, then you get the institutional knowledge uh, of employees, so they are doing what they have done. Nobody writes it down, they're learning it to the newcomers, and that's how it works. But if you would like to have a digital solution, so a program uh, that helps you with your regular business, then you need it to be defined because a digital business framework is well defined, and if you want to fit it in, you need to define a typical. Uh, Latin business process. Okay, so you define it, but you get a kind of different thing. It's analog. You cannot put one-to-one -one a business process from an analog world to a digital world. 
it's not going to happen because in the digital world you are acting differently you have different possibilities but also uh some things that you would do in an analog way you could not do in a digital way i needed to you know redesign my whole lecture at the university so to fit in a digital standard so that's why you also need to take careful account what kind of uh, digital solutions you take you need to redesign them and to um, fit them as much as possible to their business process but of course it won't be perfect you cannot digitalize everything there will be some parts of the business process especially those that uh, are based on human to human relationships it cannot be digitized so you need to take that into account you cannot digitize everything because that's obsolete that's wasting of money and of your investment but still if you have done all the things perfectly you have designed your business process you have designed your digital framework you have tailor-made it you have implemented it in a proper way there's still one thing missing in the picture do you know what because that's the most important question and the most important thing that when talking to experts we came upon there's one thing missing in the whole digital revolution and that's the pandemic revealed these are the people you need to put people in the middle of the digitization process so it specialists you need to talk to them you need to build their soft skills so they can manage the product of uh, redesigning uh, digital products you need to know what are the needs of back-end users what are the needs of front-end users you need to take into account your employees what are they willing to do if they are willing to work with the kind of tool you design maybe it's the optimal tool it's perfect but no one wants to work with it or has not the digital skill to work with that so then it's wasted money and we had plenty of examples of such kind of ill-conceived um, digital solutions in our report so if you would like just go there because i'm uh, I think my time is ending right now. Um, what's more in the report, we um, put forward some recommendations, some key recommendations, uh, which in our opinion are crucial to smooth the transition from an analog world to a digital world. And these are you know, investment in infrastructure was quite obvious, but still you need to amplify it. You need to change legislation so that um, the legisl legislation is more um, um, convenient for digital solutions you need to have a roadmap how to bring uh, the economy into a digital world how to bring the society into a digital world uh, you need to help business to redesign their um, business um, process so that it can be easily digitized and then of course education which is a very big problem and if we do not bring education into the 21st century and we remain with a 19th century type of education we will have a big problem in the future with people that do not have the skills for tomorrow that's it for me here on the last slide you have qr codes for the report so you can just make a photo and download it right away or the search for Politica Insight and uh, on Twitter on uh, LinkedIn and you'll find the report over there okay thank you I hope I did not took too much of your time um, and I pass the voice again to Monica thank you thank you Adam uh, for the presentation uh, as we can see, what is really important and yet overseen is human factor. Uh, for example, our personal fragility, social inequalities or management in the workplace. Uh, so it's not obvious since the discussion is dominated with uh, the technological issues. Uh, but future skills are not only about, uh, about them. Uh, and I encourage you to read the whole report uh, because it's very, uh, very good work. Uh, and now we will start our discussion. Uh, I believe that uh, Mr. Rittel is still not present, but perhaps he will join us during the uh, debate. Uh, and um, uh, my plan is to uh, discuss some of the recommendations uh, of the report, uh, since our panelists uh, had chance to, uh, to read it. 
And uh, first of all, I would like to start with a nationwide roadmap for digitalization the economy and society. And uh, we know that Poland repeatedly uh, made the efforts, sometimes fruitful, sometimes not, to digitalize some aspects uh, of economy and society. However, uh, they were never addressed as the whole, uh, as a systemic issue. Uh, so what obstacles appeared in that process and how may we overcome them? Uh, and this question I would like uh, addressed for start to, to Adam. Okay, thank you. I uh, had the time to take a sip of tea um, before answering. Mm, you know, of course, Poland did uh, engage uh, in um, designing how to bring the economy uh, into a digital age. But the problem is, and that's one of the main findings of our report, um, is that it's not only the strategy, the roadmap that you need, you need also a uh, enforcement roadmap. So how you will uh, tell different kind of uh, administration workers, different departments at the government that they need to do this and this and that and that moment. So you do not need only the strategy by itself like uh, Poland Digital 2030, um, but also you need uh, an enforcement strategy. And that's uh, again, mm, a very important uh, thing uh, if you compare Poland and other big countries, especially from the Central and Eastern Europe, to small countries like Estonia or Singapore. So these are the countries that uh, excelled at introducing digital solutions. Why was it easier there? We talked with experts from these countries and we found out that it was easier there because, simple as that, this is a smaller country. So if you have a strategy, then everyone is included in designing the strategy, and then it's quite easy to enforce because you know you just go uh, one desk farther uh, within the government and tell, okay, this and this needs to be done, and it's easy to be done in such a kind of small country uh, with a small government with not many business. Um, um, but not in a country like Poland when you need a consensus. And that um, takes into account all uh, the entities that are stakeholders of the digital process uh, transformation. So mm, I think that's that's very important. That's what we need uh, to learn. A strategy, of course, a roadmap is important, but then the enforcement of the roadmap is, I think, even more important. It's crucial. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Arabacic, because since you are um, in the middle of the uh, separate sectors, I mean, you work with public administration, we work with business, uh, you are connected with uh, academia. Uh, do you see uh, some obstacles in the cooperation between the three, uh, these three when it comes to uh, enabling the future skills in Poland? Uh, we can't hear you. Thank you, Mrs. Moderator. Thank you, Adam, for great presentation. Uh, in my work uh, as a CEO in academy, also in my education, I see many times problems between cooperation between government, NGOs, science and of course companies it's probably the one of the biggest problem not only in digital in digitalization but also in social skills and economy uh, uh, i think that uh, we have to change uh, our thinking in poland and i see all because pandemic is quite big problem for Polish economy and for society, but in, for this report and change of economy is giving us signs that there are also big possibilities. And one of the biggest possibilities is to change our thinking and way of working and making more cooperation than in the, before the pandemic. I believe that uh, education uh, can be good uh, good tool uh, since the report uh, uh, marks the uh, need to um, 
advancing future skills in public education and also support for human capital investment, uh, which means that also we should um, invest in uh, lifelong uh, learning. Uh, and it is uh, quite interesting because at the one hand, Poland experienced huge educational boom at the beginning of century, uh, since many uh, people uh, than ever before started to go to the university. Uh, but uh, at the other hand, we observe uh, lacks in future skills, as we can see uh, in this report. Uh, and also future skills should be taught not as the abstract construct during, for example, separate lessons, but rather as a tool. Uh, but this approach seems rather revolutionary in Polish school education and practices in lifelong learning. So uh, basic question is, are we pre prepared for this revolution? I think we are prepared, but as you said, and as, and as it's written in the report, uh, uh, we have a big lack of practical skills and it's also connected uh, with digital skills we know how to turn on the computer to install some thing but we don't know how to work on this computer many times and it's everything it's written in this report it's written in for example a very good report of polish economical institute from june this year and i see it also in my work uh, at the academy or in normal life Okay, um, that, well, uh, I would like to ask the next question to uh, Mr. Kurczewski, uh, since the National Center for Research and Development grants European funding for Paris Enterprises in Power Program. And could you give some best examples of adapting and accelerating future skills from projects that you financed? Is it something we can learn from? Yes, well, we actually have, hello, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, tools in a way to, to implement um, uh, implement the programs and, and uh, provide funding for uh, uh, coming up with solutions uh, which can uh, accelerate digitalization and actually making the uh, Polish uh, society more digital. But if, if you don't mind, I'd like to come back to the previous points about uh, about the strategy, because this is something that comes from, from my previous experience, I used to be in telecoms uh, for, for a long time. And uh, um, uh, precisely exactly what Alexander mentioned, uh, that uh, there is a problem of communication between business and, and, uh, and the government. Uh, and I, from my, my personal opinion is that it's, it comes from the fact that uh, in order for people to communicate and reach goals, they, they have to know what they want. And the fact that, uh, that uh, digitalization in Poland was uh, run previously under numerous different institutions, even though Poland has a digitalization ministry or had a digitalization ministry, there were a lot of stakeholders and uh, it didn't seem like uh, there was a one single vision uh, which could uh, um, say where we want to be in a, a point in time, 2020, 2030, whatever. And in many ways, the government being um, a servant to the people, uh, as it should be, uh, should know what kind of services uh, would want to have uh, provided to the people. And, uh, and uh, that vision, that strategy, if this was really created at the national level, institution by institution, in fact, uh, then the communication with the, with the business uh, would be probably easier. And then coming up with solutions would be also easier. That's, that's just a little bit of a tick of, uh, of my past life. But in order to implement uh, those, that, that vision, assuming that this vision is uh, more or less clear to everyone participating, we do have that in, in, in NCBR. We have uh, a very uh, cool program, which, which is called POPC. I know it from, from telecoms as, as uh, a type of a program which helped developing infrastructure in the field in white zones. It's called blank zones in, the, in, the, in this report, but white zones which were widespread in Poland, they're still existing. But POPC in NCBR is one of those programs which is intended to um, um, provide uh, problem-driven solutions for the government. And this is the program which we uh, cooperate very tightly with GovTech. Uh, we are providing solutions. We actually try to provide solutions uh, through uh, our, co our cooperation with businesses. The government is to adapt them. Uh, the, the, the critical and actually key 
element of success uh, for future of Poland is that this program is in place and the solutions are being uh, created. But they're not easy to, to implement at the national level, but assuming that we know we want to implement, there is such such tool. We have, of course, POPC. Uh, that's uh, the uh, smart growth operational program from, from uh, helped or funded by European Union, where we actually provide all kinds of tools uh, for Polish business and Polish innovators and Polish science to come up with solutions, uh, starting from uh, my favorite topic, which is uh, bridge alpha and investment funds uh, based on some um, um, quotations, uh, and also on uh, return investments uh, provided by uh, investment funds, and also in investment funds which we created and, and tools which are provided by PFR. But at the end of the day, all of these tools and all of these projects will be should be providing solutions, among others, to uh, to provide uh, uh, provide solutions for the Polish government, uh, which could be adopted by the Polish government, assuming the Polish government, uh, as any government uh, knows what they want to have uh, provided. Um, the tools are there, the scientists are there, innovators are there. I think uh, that the base uh, for future development and uh, a provision of, of services by the public government of the Polish government are there. The issue of, uh, of education uh, and, uh, and providing uh, digital skills, very interesting, but uh, from, from the point of view of those who would be providing the services, <clears throat> it's, there, was, there was always a question of uh, should or do people feel the need or uh, do they feel a need that there's the, the digitalization of their home, having a computer or having access to internet gives them anything else than just access to websites? And uh, if uh, the government and other institutions, not necessarily public, uh, have uh, all kinds of services, easy plug and play, easy to understand, uh, available, then uh, um, the need to actually use these tools will develop. This, this is actually one of those results uh, stemming from, from the unfortunate pandemic situation where uh, suddenly because of the uh, health threat, uh, people who are not necessarily digital, kind of like me, I'm semi-digital, semi-analog, I, I actually look uh, for solutions which uh, can provide me with uh, uh, protection against uh, unnecessary exposure. And, uh, and suddenly I do, and I did find several public institutions uh, um, services which are digital and I can actually use them, but I never sought them before. So um, this, the, the, this, the, the jump into the future uh, in Poland is a mix of what the government wants to provide, services which will be attractive to the public, that creates the market, that creates the, the need of the individual to actually start looking for these services that brings money and that brings development. So that's may, maybe the beginning of, of my point. Okay, I would rephrase that as a question of some kind of mentality and ability to um, use the new uh, new opportunities. Uh, however, but, yeah, of course. I mean, this is this is this is an issue. I, I, like I said, I, I worked with, with for, for telecoms in telecom industry for a number of years as a CEO as well. And, uh, and I digitalized parts of Poland. And uh, uh, I often find out that there are services available in digital world. I find them out from my daughter. So uh, because I never sought them before, and she does, because she needs it for whatever reason. So um, that's, that's how, created, that how, how the need is created, how, how people are seeking and learning uh, on day-to-day -day basis that there's, a, there's a, a solution for them in the digital world. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, as uh, we can see, at the one hand, we have this obstacle of mentality, but at the other hand, COVID happened and uh, it forced people to uh, to do the jump. Uh, That's exactly true. That's exactly true. It accelerated the need to use digital services, which were not necessarily needed by a lot of people mid-age, which I consider myself to be. Uh, I, I think it's, that. yeah, it's not only the need, uh, as we observed um, among entrepreneurs, it's um, the knowledge that uh, remote work or using digital tools really works. 
and it's not less efficient because uh, the common myth before the pandemic was that if you go and work from home or use a digital uh, or you use an app on your phone it won't be that efficient as if you go and meet with someone in person or go to an office and talk to a human being and this is i think the biggest uh, change in the attitude of the society that will accelerate uh, the process of uh, digitization so um i think that this um um, destruction of this myth that being remote is ineffective is one of the most benefits of the current situation. Uh, at the one hand, we have myths, but at the other, other hand, we have a question of resources uh, because uh, many employees and employers uh, struggle with uh, time and money, uh, for example, to um, have the space to educate themselves. Uh, also in the matter of uh, future skills. And I'm very happy to welcome uh, Mr. Anthony Ritter, um, uh, who managed to, to join us. And this is very convenient because I can pass this question uh, to him right now. Uh, so uh, what, in your opinion, can be done to enable human capital, especially in the matter of future skills? And who should be responsible for that? Right, so uh, I should probably begin by, by apologizing, uh, which I'm doing right now, for uh, my issues with connectivity. And uh, using this opportunity, I'd also like to congratulate uh, Adam and his whole team on uh, the uh, report which was just released. Uh, we uh, had the privilege of reading this uh, along with my team, and uh, it proved extremely insightful. But uh, coming back to your uh, original question, so. Um, Let's first draw the landscape of uh, digital skills across sectors in, uh, in Poland. So uh, first of all, uh, if you look at the Digital Economy and Society Index, which is uh, used as uh, sort of a barometer for most assessments of digital literacy across, um, across the European Union, um, we would see that uh, the largest factor which uh, drives down the overall score of the um, of, of Poland across uh, all, all the all the other indicators, which are 20, I think something else, um, is the uh, spread of digital technologies among the private sector companies. So uh, on average, it's uh, uh, on the uh, level of 60% uh, of the private sector enterprises having lower digital level of digital skills uh, than the EU average, which uh, is at about 39. So, so you see that there is a significant gap uh, and I think that uh, for a long time there was this approach uh, to digital skills, which said, which could be paraphrased more or less by saying uh, the government has to do its thing, has to provide services, has to uh, organize courses, have to invest in education, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and the private sector will manage. Uh, and I think that uh, what we need right now is a whole reversion of this paradigm and uh, a much wider focus on um, much less on the sort of first generation digital skills, so to say, which revolves around, uh, as, as Chimso said, into turning on the computer and, uh, and being able to handle a few matters, but uh, going much deeper into digital processes, or sort of the actual well, processes that um, uh, are the ones uh, impacted by uh, the customers. And uh, I think uh, the, the, the best thing we could do in this really is um, to make sure that we do not, uh, as the government, uh, we do not create further artificial barriers and we give, provide tools which make the whole process easier. For example, um, one of the larger barriers uh, in digitizing of the, uh, of, the other, of the second and third sector of the Polish economy uh, is the ability of digital tools. Um, so obviously, uh, when you need to construct uh, a website, it is relatively easy. But when you have to set up the whole uh, authentication regime, when you have to make sure it's GDPR compliant, et cetera, et cetera, all the problems start, suddenly start to stock up. And this is a massive discouragement for some to switch to the, uh, to the, the digital market. Uh, and uh, what uh, we think is uh, a very decent approach towards this is um, what, we, what we call digital sandboxes which effectively revolve around, say, which is a very fancy term for saying, uh, hey, the government built quite a number of services which have its use, 
for example, uh, there's a login authentication, uh, you know, we, and a number of others. Uh, so why should we require entrepreneurs to basically build the same thing from scratch? Uh, well, we can just issue an API and let them use the secure, convenient, and fast solutions which have been built by the government for the taxpayers' money. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we, uh, we are really focusing on right now is to make sure that uh, we, tr we eliminate those digital barriers of uh, not being able to set up or configure or, uh, or implement or secure or anything of the sorts of those tools and make sure that uh, if a business wants to move to the digital uh, sphere, then the, it can do so on a, on a high trust level at the same time as uh, this being convenient and uh, and, and not really costly. So uh, this is one, one aspect. And then the other aspect, what we try to uh, heavily invest in, and uh, you can uh, read about this, for example, in the, uh, the new uh, artificial intelligence policy, which has been adopted by uh, the cabinet of ministers uh, a couple of days back, uh, is, uh, to, is to um, make sure that we focus on the competence so from the basic level. We focus on the competences which um, have the highest yield value, which, uh, and by this I mean uh, the ones which then generate further competences. So uh, for, for some time, uh, we've had this issue where, uh, where uh, you training people for particular business applications is obviously important and it continues to be. But what we do need to focus right now, and I think that's uh, what, what we're planning to do very heavily is to invest in those skills, which then put people in the position to share them with others and increase the digital literacy across all sectors. Uh, so obviously I could go more and more, but I could go on and on about this, but in principle, I think that, uh, that there has to be a complete shift of paradigm, but uh, the government cannot do this alone. And uh, we're really hoping for a massive input from both the third sector and obviously businesses. Uh, I am happy that you mentioned uh, the cooperation between uh, business sector and the government because it brings us to the third recommendation I would like to discuss, which is creating and developing online platforms for companies by government with ready-made tools for digitalization. And um, I believe that we should start uh, from uh, some reflection about how usually, usually digitalization in Polish enterprise looks like and how can we make it more sufficient? And maybe Adam, you would like to address that. Yeah, thank you for this question because due to the lack of time, I did not manage to uh, mention this example because um, it's very important to realize the obstacles and uh, the whole problem that is connected to the way in which digital solutions are implemented uh, into a company. Um, we talked a lot with uh, people from IT companies that help uh, Polish business, small, medium, large enterprises to uh, go uh, with digital solutions. Um, and uh, there was this, we asked the question, who is uh, the person within a company or what is the biggest problem uh, that you meet while introducing a new digital product into uh, enterprise? And we were really shocked to hear that the biggest obstacles are usually made by IT specialists. IT specialists are sometimes uh, those people that um, slow down the whole process of digitalization. It might seem, okay, that's absurd, yeah, because they are living from it. It's not that simple, because you have a similar problem to the one that you can observe uh, on a whole labor market. It's called the insider-outsider problem. And the obstacle is, of course, generated by um, the insider IT specialist. So those IT specialists that are working in a given company, uh, they are usually, um, you know, very convenient with the IT system that they have. So they do not want any extension of it. They do not want any new uh, responsibility. They just want to run business as they know, because adding something to it means more uh, 
more problems. What's more, if you digitize the economy uh, or even a small business, you always will have some bugs, some problems with digitization that you need to solve. But who is responsible for the bugs? Usually, uh, if the boss is thinking about the whole digitization problem, he thinks that the problem are the IT people in the company. So they don't want to take the responsibility for any problems that happen during the digitization process. So that's why they are also saying no to any new ideas. What's more, they are lacking of soft skills uh, of managing a bigger IT team, to contact with other IT specialists, to ask the people in the company uh, what they want. You know, the stereotypical uh, way in which IT are functioning, the IT departments. I think you all know uh, TV series about uh, IT specialists, you know it from your own company. And sometimes it works like this, really, that you go to an IT specialist and I say, you know, uh, turn on and off your computer, that should solve your problem. Uh, so they don't want to take more responsibility. And that's what we hear from IT specialists themselves. Um, so what is happening in such a kind of situation? Mm. IT specialists within the company, so insiders are saying, we don't want uh, innovation because it's difficult, there will be problem and so on. So they go to the boss and say no. The boss or um, the managing board is saying, we want innovation, so let's uh, have outsiders to introduce it. Okay, great, but the interest of outsiders, their main objective is to do it as fast as possible with as many work as possible. So they just bring us a um, perfect solution uh, that's not tailor-made, it's one size fits all, uh, give it to the boss, they just turn on, plug it in, and the digital solution is there. No one wants to use it, it's not uh, closely connected to, uh, to employees, they, um, it does not solve their problems, customers do not know how to use it, and we have a kind of public relation uh, kind of uh, entrance of a digital solution, and then two months later, everyone forgets about it. So uh, that's, of course, not always uh, the problem, but such kind of problems to a larger or lesser extent exist in companies. So this insider-outsider problem and the way digital solutions are introduced. That's why I think a very good idea is to have uh, you know, um, kind of wide spectrum, a list of different kind of digital solutions that you can easily adapt in your companies, in your company, uh, ask employees which of the solution they want, test some of them, and then uh, target the exact problem that you want to have, and also provide IT specialists with the power and soft skills to help to introduce it. Uh, that would be especially good for micro companies that do not have the resources to tailor made uh, different kind of solutions. So they have a wide spectrum of different kind of products that really work in companies uh, that are similar to theirs. Uh, of course, ready-made solutions uh, are uh, very convenient to use. And uh, I, I agree that it's enab it enables to, uh, to use uh, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, occasions to innovate but it doesn't really solve the problem of the local innovator uh, who wants to uh, improve who wants to change and uh, this is my question to uh, the rest of the panelists uh, who in your opinion is the change motivator in polish business usually if i may just for a second because uh, uh, Referring to what, what Antoni mentioned um, uh, about this kind of a, a ready-made and, and populous uh, authentication problem, for example, I, I think it's actually one of those small critical things which people don't appreciate uh, enough. Because uh, when you when you run SME um, com company or something even smaller than SME, those kind of uh, beginning costs of operations are absolutely critical. Most of these people pr pretty much use their own savings to, to start a company when you start thinking about authentication system or a basic cybersecurity system for your web page. Um, it, it sometimes um, is put away in time as not the critical investment or the beginning investment and suddenly someone crashes your 
web page and start stealing uh, credit cards of your customers and, um, and you lose your business because you lose trust of your customers. So uh, such solutions, which, which Antonio mentioned uh, as a basic starting tool for small business, I think are critical. If we want to have those unicorns coming into the future, they have to start somewhere. And that initial help would be, I think, very helpful. And uh, and uh, I sign my name under this uh, those type of solutions at any time. And CBR actually has programs that can help developing that. So uh, please call us. Uh, there's also a, a lot of truth to what uh, Adam mentioned uh, that uh, IT sometimes is IT people. I mean, not all of them, but some of them are basically comfortable, feel comfortable, you want to have a comfortable life. That's why it's it's uh, so critical to find that one IT person or two IT persons who have a different mindset, who are actually uh, change makers in uh, in institutions or in, uh, in businesses. Uh, I did meet some of them, they're priceless. Uh, and uh, they actually are those who create disruption in, uh, in IT systems, but it's often as a result of what non-IT people uh, want to accomplish. It's in many ways, uh, the IT people need to hear what business wants to accomplish. And, and once you have uh, the kind of a um, strategy developed, which shows where you want to take your business, IT in many ways, not always, but in many ways, is critical implementation, uh, uh, effective implementation of the strategy and providing the safe tools to, to implement the strategy, but you have to have a vision. And, um, and the vision is actually the, 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 the key element of success for any business. I'm not saying anything innovative here, I'm basically absolutely, I think normal, uh, uh, but um, uh, then the finding the basic tool that can uh, provide you uh, protection and uh, safe environment for your customers in the initial stage, as Antonio mentioned, and then finding a, a, a people who will help you develop uh, your IT systems to provide the services to people or provide new products, whatever it is, that's, um, uh, that's critical. And developing skills of these critical people, again, something I think what Antonio may have talked about this the way I understood it. We need to invest in probably smaller group, but better uh, that can make a change. And then you have a lot of followers and that's how you create, that's how you create the mass which can provide services and, and uh, to, to a larger number of businesses. If we can uh, develop that kind of uh, plan for education, that would be very good for, for, for everyone. Poland for, for businesses. And so. I, I couldn't agree more uh, for the first thing, and thank you for those very kind remarks. But uh, uh, really, I think uh, what, what you said fits very well with also uh, what Adam mentioned about the inside out, insiders and outsiders. So, uh, especially in the public sector, I think uh, this uh, revolves around trust. So, uh, let's have a hypothetical example. Uh, which is uh, all too common in, in, in most, at least, central government institutions. Um, there is, and we've verified this numerous times, a number of people uh, who uh, do have ideas. Some of them have the skills to sort of map them to the available technology. But um, what they really need, and uh, this is actually one of the sort of key services we're trying to provide uh, to the public sector, is that they need a sort of a trusted consultant. Because uh, in most cases, um, it's very hard to uh, engage an external consultant, not just because of uh, all those uh, formalities attached to it, but also due to the fact that uh, you know, most purely external consultants generally do not have this uh, good of an overview of how the public administration works. I mean, which is obviously understandable. They, um, uh, uh, but they, they, they just sort of do not the swim in this ocean, so to say. But um, so, so what is really needed, I think, and, and what uh, is uh, a, a massive market and a massive change maker potentially is uh, the ability for public sector institutions to have this sort of a, um, a, a point, a subject, a, uh, another a focal point, which they know they can always rely on without, and asking for help is not really, uh, is not attached to a large uh, to a large cost. So, you know, in principle, obviously, uh, 
it, again, I'm not saying anything new here, but uh, when uh, assistance is required, and most often it is, uh, there is always a need for someone to provide it. And when the cost of reaching out to, for the assistance is greater than the expected benefit of receiving the assistance, uh, then people just do not reach out to it, plain and simple. Um, and uh, this may lead to uh, a number of wasted opportunities. We've seen this time and time again uh, in, in one institution after another. So uh, I, I think it is really crucial to, um, to make sure that the cost of reaching out to others is as low as possible. And one of the uh, best ways to do it, in fact, there is nothing in any bill in the whole country preventing you from doing this, uh, is uh, what we're also trying to promote, I know ACBR does the same thing, uh, is to really promote the outreach. And uh, you know, there are actual sort of legal ways which do not, uh, they do away with all the potential implications of colluding or being in cahoots with someone. But um, so it's, there are ways to do it, and they're actually very simple. But uh, there are just one article among 700 uh, in, in a particular bill, which just has not been used so often. Uh, one example is the so called technical dialogue, which uh, is uh, really a fancy term for uh, a business consultation before a, a procurement, a purchase is made uh, uh, for, for anything with technology, especially. Uh, it is absolutely legal, it's absolutely available, but people just do not know about it uh, most often. So um, what we're trying to do, and I think what is really important to do at, at, at some point is uh, to, uh, first of all, promote the tools which already exist for, um, reach, for, for to enable the public institutions to reach out to the market, to the third sector, uh, to, to uh, just actual users. You, there are different ways to do it, and uh, I, I won't go too deep into them, but in principle, those mechanisms do exist, one of them I mentioned before. And, and the other stream, which we must uh, heavily invest in, and uh, again, this is what we're trying to do for, or we've been trying to do for quite, uh, uh, quite some time, is uh, to, to make sure that the, regardless of the external consultant, there's also this insider which knows the specificity of your area, of uh, the circumstances you operate under, and is able to help you and assist you with, uh, you know, with validating or piloting or any, providing any other assistance with the, the idea, the project you have. And uh, I assure you that if those two circumstances are met, then there is no shortage of demand for innovation and ideas for innovation within the public sector. Thank you. I will stop you there because we got two questions from, uh, from the public, very interesting ones, and I would like to uh, address them. And I believe that uh, first of the two is uh, the best uh, be best fits to uh, Alexander Rabacic. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it is like this. How can we adapt the European lessons learned to the develop, developing world? Uh, we can't hear you. This is moderator, thank you, Mr. Imran. I'm reading now your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what we can teach uh, developing world? I think we have to teach them more, to be more optimistic. I know that we have now hard times and the whole world have the hard times. That's hard times make uh, the strongest leader. It's may okay. First thing, but uh, as uh, we are talking all the time today, you have to adapt to, you, you have to know how to adapt. You cannot be too much conservative to one way. You have to know how to find some other solutions, how to cooperate. And I think this is the question, not only optimistic, but hard work. Uh, and as I said before, not so conservative and to know how to find some other ways to solve the problem. Okay, thank you. And I will add to, to, to a sentence, two sentences uh, to what Alex said, because um, to give uh, you from the developing countries uh, a more optimistic approach, I would tell you that uh, the revolution from an uh, analog world to a digital world is not really dependent on uh, whether you are already a more developed country or less uh, developed country. Sometimes it's even better to uh, skip one or two steps 
uh, in a way in which you um, uh, access the digital age. Because if you look at, for example, cashless payments and you compare Poland to Germany, uh, you see that Poland is one of the world leaders in implementing cashless payments because we did not have the former levels uh, of uh, payments with tax were not much developed. So we just entered the, the cashless payments world uh, just from a pure uh, cash-driven uh, economy. Uh, and that's kind of optimistic. So you, of course, need to uh, pursue the same goals, so infrastructure, soft skills, uh, uh, agenda, but um, you have the same or even better chances to advance if you manage to uh, to tag all those items that we're talking here during the discussion. So thank you. That, that's it from me. Uh, and the second question, uh, which I believe is addressed uh, or to Przemysław Kurczewski or to Antoni Rytel, uh, the digitalization platform that you have developed in Poland for small business, is it on open source or uh, and is it globally scalable? I mean, uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, this is a question to ask, but uh, we do have a platform for small uh, SME, so uh, it is quite possible it may have been referring to, to, to it. Um, so uh, two questions. Um, it's uh, starting from the end. Uh, we do believe it is scalable, but um, I think that what we need to keep in mind is that a platform is just a long list of lines of code. Uh, but what the platform enables and what actually drives sort of the, the actual potential before, behind the solution, what made it so successful uh, in attracting SMEs to, 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 uh, to procurement is uh, that the model which stands behind it and which it helps to enforce and make simpler. Uh, so uh, really, I think uh, the, well, the platform it's obviously easily scalable and adaptable and we're happy to make it available. Uh, we actually did. It, it is uh, semi-open source in, in it, meaning that we are willing to share it, but it's not sort of in a repository which you can just download with the press of a button. And the reason for this is really simple because we believe that uh, sort of just implementing the tool is not really the best way forward. Uh, what, what needs to be done is a uh, implement the whole mechanism behind it. And we're obviously happy to help uh, other countries. It's actually, we're doing this already uh, uh, in, with uh, some of the developing countries uh, as part of development aid. But, uh, but I think that's what really people need to think about is the, uh, is the actual uh, things that those tools enforce rather than the tools themselves. Uh, I know if Jimmy would like to add something about the, another tool perhaps that he has. Yeah, I was, I was referring to the same tool, and uh, uh, the principle is that it's supposed to provide a basic level of trust and uh, at a certain level of development. And uh, sooner or later, assuming that business develops and gets a scale, uh, entrepreneurs do come up with their own solutions. And uh, but uh, the basic principle, the basic tool at the very beginning, that's the the, the launching path for, for for any business. So that's all. Thank you very much for answers and for the participation in the panel. Uh, we have run out, uh, out of time, but I believe that our discussion was very fruitful. And uh, please leave your feedback. Uh, and of course, uh, I again encourage you to read the whole report, Skills for Tomorrow, which is av available at Politica Insight website. Uh, and I hope to meet you uh, someday uh, live, uh, not in this uh, horrible circumstances of COVID. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you also, Mrs. Moderator. Thank you, dear. Panelists. Thank you, participants. Thank you, Monica. It was a Mate, big. It was great to take part here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.